Welcome to the Respy Summit. This is Neil Gala and my colleague Pawan Kumar from Incore Semiconductors. And today we'll be delivering the tutorial running the architectural compatibility test on your model. Let's get started. To, to set the tone for the tutorial, it's primarily targeted towards test and verification engineers. Having said that, the bar to truly follow this tutorial is pretty low. Uh, we only assume very basic and amateurish level skills in Respy Assembly and RTL of your choice and Python. Right. That should be more than enough to grab the essence of the tutorial and be on your way to run these ACTs on your model. ACTs, the what, why and when. Now, ACT stands for Architectural Compatibility Test, which is basically a collection of assembly level tests with a primary intent to qualify whether a designer has truly interpreted and implemented the spec correctly. Right. So the ACT is primarily focused on positive testing. That is, does the implementation mimic the exact behavior specified by the spec? We do not focus on negative testing because the behavior is usually undefined in most cases when our, when our implementation chooses to not implement a particular feature. Note that, that this is particularly different from testing alternate behaviors like misaligned accesses where the spec itself defines more than one ways to implement a particular feature. The ACDs are also signature based. What this means is that every test has a specific region of memory which captures the essence of the execution of the test like the results of a certain operations of instructions, flags, or architectural states, and so on. We refer to this region of memory as the signature of the test. Now, the expectation is that the same test when run on the reference model, that's like the sale model, or, and your DOT or your implementation, the signatures generated by both should match. Only then you can claim that the particular DOT passes that test. Right? If all applicable tests within the ACT suite pass on a given implementation, it can be claimed to be RISC-5 compatible. I would like to strongly highlight the fact that ACT is not to be treated as a substitute for design verification, but rather as a very tiny subset of it. What this basically means is that any implementation that passes the ACT cannot be claimed to be bug free. What it can be claimed is that it truly understands the spec, it's implemented the spec truthfully or correctly, such that a software adhering to the same spec would more or less uh, execute flawlessly on that implementation. Well, now you must be wondering why uh, should you even bother with ACTs if it's not the same as a design verification? Well, uh, purely for branding purposes. You will need your implementation to pass the ACT test for branding purposes. If you would like to brand your implementation as RISC-5 compatible, it is necessary to show that your implementation passes these uh, passes the ACT test suite, and is which and this can usually be achieved through self-certification. Self-certification basically means you run the ACTs on your implementation in your environment uh, and simply expose the report which displays that all the tests have passed on a public forum. Now, ideally, you would run that ACT test post-verification since at the point uh, we don't expect any new bugs to be raised. But as you will see through the tutorial, the setup and the environments and the framework required to get the ACTs up is quite minimal and easy as compared to what you would be doing for design verification. So one could also repurpose ACTs as a litmus test suite in the early, early stages of design verification. Now, the ACTs have certain requirements and assumptions from the core and the testing environment in order to be run successfully. Uh, the first one being the ability to install a custom trap handler by the test. This basically entails that all the XTVEC registers like MTVEC or STVEC should be writable or at least hardwired to point to a region which is 64 byte aligned. And more importantly, that region has uh, read, write, and execute permissions. And the next assumption is regarding physical memory attributes. Uh, each test has broadly three major sections, uh, the code, the data, and the signature region. Based on the configuration and the implement of the implementation, the code section may require performing loads and store operations at a four byte granularity operations and definitely requires execute permissions. Uh, the data in the signature regions are quite standard and uh, they basically require permissions for all sized byte operations depending on the uh, base ISA that the implementation supports. Currently, the ACTs are guaranteed to work on the implementations which are homogeneous in behavior uh, when it comes to misaligned accesses. What this means is that if an implementation partially supports misaligned accesses or misaligned accesses only work under certain runtime configurations and pass or trap for the others, in such scenarios, the ACTs are not given a, uh, do not guarantee to pass in such implementations. Finally, the ACTs assume the weak memory ordering memory model as defined by the ISA. Now, if you were to look at the ACT directory, you will realize that it's nothing more than a pool of tests or rather a collection of test suites put together. 
right? And each test in, uh, is an assembly test, which is further broken down into smaller test cases. And the aim of each test case is to basically uh, check certain aspects or specific alternate behaviors of a main feature. So going back to the concept of positive testing that I was talking about, for any given implementation, we expect only to run relevant tests and test cases as asserted by the choices made by the implementation. For example, if I have a device which only implements the I and the M extensions, there is no reason for me to run the floating point or the bit mandip extensions on this particular DUT. Therefore, the configurable nature of the uh, test basically warrant a tool which can not only filter the test, but also filter the test cases within each test that need to be run on a particular implementation in order to prove compatibility. We call this tool RISCOF, which stands for RISC-5 uh, Compatibility Framework. This is an open source Python tool, uh, the details of which will be uh, highlighted by Pawan in this tutorial. Now, before we get into RISCOF, uh, there are a few tools that you will need to install to get started with. The first one is uh, the tool chain or the compiler tool chain. We recommend using the RISC-5 GNU tool chain, but you're always free to use your own custom uh, SDK or tool chains uh, that, that fits well with your implementation. You'll also need to install the RISC-V sale model. Now this particular model acts as the reference model against which compatibility is being proven. And finally, you'll need to install the RISC-V tool, uh, which is a Python package and for which you will need uh, Python 3.6 and above. So this slide basically captures few frequently encountered issues that you will face while installing these tools. Uh, for example, you will need uh, sudo or root access in order to install the dependencies uh, in order to build your toolchain and sale model, right? While each of these can be built in the user space, uh, the final executables can be built in the user space. Building them requires certain packages which needs to be installed using uh, root permissions. On Red Hat systems, you will typically find that the C3 solver and the OPAM packages which are required by sale are not available as standard packages. So you'll have to resort at installing them through sources. If you're working on an older distribution, it's possible that your Python version is slightly older and you will have to upgrade those to uh, 3.6 or above. And I would highly recommend using virtual environments in order to do that. This does not break your existing uh, Python setup. Uh, I would like to thank Mark Karasak from Inspire Semi who has put up a couple of scripts which will help you install these seamlessly on whether you're on Ubuntu or Red Hat. And the link is provided on the slide. If at the end of the day you're still struggling with installing sale or you would rather avoid installing sale for uh, for other reasons, you can also use sale as a, as a Docker container. So remember that we use sale as a reference model to in order to generate reference signatures for every test, right? And all of that can be encapsulated inside a single Docker container, which Riskov can directly instantiate, invoke, and process the output of. Right. And we've provided the link for the Docker container to, in order to speed things up, it would be good if you can download the image. With that, I believe, I hope uh, I've set the tone for the tutorial and I've explained what the necessity and the, uh, the aspects of the different aspects of ACTs are. I'd like to hand over the platform now to, uh, uh, to Pawan, who's going to talk more in detail about RISCOF and how you can actually get your model working with RISCOF in order to prove compatibility with RISC-5. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for that introduction. Now let's take a look at uh, how RISCOF functions as a whole. The inputs to RISCOF are a suite directory and the YAML configuration for your particular implementation. Now, this configuration should include all the optional de behaviors defined by the spec, uh, including any WARL descriptions. Uh, once RISCOF has these files, it you, uh, runs it through RISC-V config to generate the standard YAML, which is then used to filter and run tests. Uh, only the filter tests are run on your implementation. And since uh, ACT follows uh, uh, no negative testing policy, uh, only the tests which are applicable for your particular con implementation's configuration are uh, selected and run, and signatures are compared with the reference model. Uh, and if the signatures match, then the test is deemed to have passed, otherwise uh, the test is a failure. There are three steps to uh, running uh, ACTs on RISCOF. The first is the database generation phase. In the database generation phase, uh, RISCOF takes a suite directory path and it passes through all the files in that directory to extract all relevant information about the test. 
uh, it, it includes uh, the additional macros which need to be generated, the conditions under which the particular test is uh, selected, and also you know the uh, arc, uh, MR string for that particular test compilation. Now, once RISCOF has all of this information, it dumps it out uh, into a file which is called the database.yaml file. Then the second step is the test list generation, where uh, the standard YAML and the database is used to filter the tests and define all the necessary macros for that for, for those tests. This information is also dumped out as a test list YAML file. And finally, using the list of filter tests, uh, the risk of passes this information to both the DOT plugin and the reference plugin, plugin to run the tests on the implementations. Uh, to and generate the signatures and finally compare them to generate a HTML report. Uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, this cop can be stopped at each I and mean, every step uh, in this particular process, and you can uh, manually uh, override uh, risk of uh, to use the artifacts from a previous or an older run uh, of this cop. So essentially, you you can uh, have a custom database file and. Uh, ask Viskov to use that particular database file uh, similarly for the test list file too. Uh, on the screen right now are uh, two different uh, commands uh, which show uh, the artifacts created uh, as part of each of these uh, steps. The first is the database generation artifact. Uh, so if, if you look at the command, you have a hyphen hyphen suite argument and a particular directory is passed. So this is the uh, directory for the ACT suite in this particular case. Uh, at the end of this particular step, if you look at the work directory, you will see that a database.yaml file is created uh, and you can use this particular YAML file uh, to override uh, information in any of, any of the further steps. Then comes the uh, test list step. Uh, so you, you can run it by uh, using the command risk of space test list. And uh, the, the command is similar to the database generation command, but the artifacts uh, are not similar. Additional artifacts are generated. Now let's take a look at the additional artifacts. The first is the test list YAML file, uh, which as I explained previously, contains a filtered list of the tests. Uh, then there is a work directory which is created by Riskov. Now, this is the work directory where Riskov expects all the signature files to be present. And uh, at the end of your implementation run, uh, all the test artifacts should be present in these uh, work directories. Now, if you take a look further into the hierarchy of work directories, there will be a work directory which is created for each and every individual test uh, so that, uh, that there is no confusion as to where the signatures have to be present. Then finally, you also have the checked YAMLs uh, of your uh, duty configuration, which are generated by uh, passing the uh, input YAMLs through the risk 5 config tool. Then we have the uh, run command. Now, uh, as I mentioned previously, you can uh, use artifacts from one of the previous steps uh, by passing the, the argument via command line. So if you take a look at the first command in this particular case, uh, it, it shows an example on how to run tests using a custom database file. Uh, to do so, you just need to use the hyphen hyphen db file argument on the command line and pass a path to the uh, database file, which was generated or which is present on your uh, local setup. Similarly, uh, you can uh, you, you can ensure that the tests are run only on the reference model or only on the DUT by using a couple of flags. This particular example shows how on how uh, uh, how to run the tests only on the reference model. Uh, you can do so by using the hyphen hyphen no uh, DUT run uh, flag on the command line. And the third example on your screen, uh, it, it shows how to run the tests on the reference model using an existing test list. It is similar to how you would pass the DB file argument. You use the hyphen hyphen test file uh, argument on the command line and you pass uh, the path to the test file. Right? Now, all three of these commands are equivalent in the nature of the artifacts which are generated. Essentially, uh, an additional artifact which is generated is just the make file from the reference model at this point. 
then uh, we come to the command which runs the tests on both DUT and the uh, implementation and compares the signatures. Uh, it is similar to all the commands which we have been seeing before and uh, similar to the previous commands, you can use hyphen hyphen db file or hyphen hyphen test file to uh, uh, pass custom uh, file locations. The additional artifacts which are generated over here are the make file from the implementation and then finally the report.html file. This HTML report would contain uh, information regarding which tests were selected, uh, how, what was the configuration under which the tests were run, what were the additional macros uh, generated for the for that particular test, and uh, whether the signature ma signatures matched, or if there was a mismatch, what was the mismatch. Now let's come to the uh, testing environment requirements for running the ACTs uh, on your implementation. It is recommended that the tests are run in RTL simulation mode on your uh, particular code uh, with minimal additional modules present. Uh, essentially, just the heart, the memory module, and a signature dumping mechanism uh, in the test harness. The tests only uh, target the core features, that is uh, whatever is specified in the ISA, and they do not test any of the platform features even though some platform features influence the tests at the moment. Uh, a, a couple of the examples are misaligned memory access support and uh, the PMAs of different uh, addressable regions in memory. But it should be kept in mind that as long as the minimum requirements for running the test uh, are present, as well as there is a method to extract the signatures uh, fr from your environment, you should be able to run these tests uh, on any environment, uh, essentially uh, a simulator or uh, post silicon production, etc. But the tests are have been crafted, uh, keeping in mind the RTL simulation as the target uh, environment. Let's take a look at the test harness requirements. The first is uh, PMAs. So, uh, as illustrated by Neil in one of the previous slides, uh, each and every region has a minimum PMA requirement, and those need to be satisfied. Uh, then there are uh, certain minimum memory requirements per section. Uh, in total, uh, at the current state, the tests require at least 1.14 GB uh, of memory to be present. But in future, this uh, requirement may be reduced to 21 MB to allow for a more versatile uh, testing environment. Finally, uh, your test harness needs to have the ability to dump out memory regions, which are designated as signature. To identify which memory region uh, is the signature region, you should look at the memory which is bounded by the uh, RV test underscore sig underscore begin and RV test underscore sig underscore end labels uh, once the test has been compiled. Uh, the output format for the signature uh, is very specific. Uh, the, out, uh, the, the file should have four bytes per line in Little Indian format. Now let's take a look at uh, a few test harness examples using certain open source implementations out there. A point to note over here is that uh, there is no recommended way of doing things or there is no right or wrong way of doing things. These are just a few examples uh, out there and uh, you are free to choose your own uh, method to dump the signature. The first example is the chromite core from uh, in -core semiconductors. Uh, for, for the test harness, the chromite core uh, instantiates the chromite heart itself, uh, the uh, click module, a sign dump module, and a main memory module, uh, which all talk to each, each other via the system bus. Now, the sign dump module is essentially a memory map module or a memory map peripheral uh, at uh, the location 0x20,000. It is a non-synthesizable module which uh, at the end of the test performs DMA-like accesses uh, to the signature region and uh, dumps them out into a particular file. And after dumping them out, it just performs a halting uh, routine or a, a exit routine so that the simulation can be uh, ended. It uses the language file IO constructs to uh, perform the dump at this point. Uh, Essentially, at the uh, end of the test, uh, the test will have an assembly sequence something like this. 
where uh, you load the value of begin signature and uh, write it onto the uh, respective field inside the sign dump module. That is the start address field inside the sign dump module. Uh, similarly, you load the end signature uh, address and you write it into the end address field inside the module. And once a non-zero value is written onto the exit field, uh, the module will go ahead and start performing the DMA accesses, uh, dump out the signature and exit. The next example which we will look at is the SERV code, the serve code. Uh, for the test harness, the serve code instantiates uh, the core itself, a GPIO module, a main memory module, and a timer module, which all talk to uh, each other via the system bus. Now, the serve uh, has a peculiar way of dumping the signature, where essentially the arbiter inside the uh, system bus uh, performs the signature dumping mechanism. Uh, again, this is also a sim only behavior where any uh, writes to 0x80 million are written out uh, into, into a particular file, uh, but uh, you know, uh, and writes to the 0x90 million location uh, halts the simulation. Uh, the uh, memory overview of the serve test harness is as follows. Right? Uh, the RAM is accessible from 0 to 40 million uh, GPIO uh, functions uh, are available from 40 million to 80 million, and the sim funk and timer. Uh, this this sim funk is the uh, module which takes care of the signature dumping and the halting methods. Uh, even even serve uses the language file I/O constructs uh, such as fwrite to dump out the ASCII character. Uh, for serve, the assumption is that uh, the signature is converted into ASCII characters equivalent ASCII hex values. Uh, before writing it into the location. And hence, the pseudocode for halt is a little bit more involved at this point, where you start reading from the begin signature location, convert it into the equivalent ASCII character, which should be written out uh, inside the assembly, and then write it into the 0x80 million location. Once uh, you have uh, done this for the entire uh, signature region, you just write a non-zero value into 0x90 million and uh, the simulation halts. Something similar is also implemented by the new RB32 uh, implementation out there, which uses a sim only uh, UART module to dump out the signature. The assembly pseudocode looks similar, but instead of using the file IO constructs uh, of the language like serf, it uses a sim only uh, UART module. Uh, for more information, you can uh, refer to the links in the PPT or uh, the repo GitHub repositories uh, themselves. Then uh, finally, let's take a look at the IBEX core. Uh, the test harness for the IBEX core is as follows. It has the core, the RAM, uh, some additional test utility modules, and the system bus itself. It is similar to all the other implementations which we have seen so far. The test util module is again uh, a memory map peripheral, which is memory mapped at 0x82 million. Uh, it is a non synthesizable module again, and it also uses uh, language IO constructs such as display. Uh, but the, the, there is no direct uh, file IO operation being performed over here, and hence there is some amount of post processing involved uh, at this point where uh, you know, the environment needs to use. Uh, shell commands such as grep and set to extract the signature from the execution logs and put it into a particular signature file. Uh, if you look at the equivalent uh, assembly code, uh, it is similar to the uh, Chromite's uh, assembly uh, code where you just take the uh, begin signature address, you write it into the uh, into the peripheral, into the address begin field, and uh, similarly, you also do the same thing for the end signature uh, value. And finally, uh, you write a non-zero into the uh, a non-zero value into the test uh, util base location, and uh, it ends the simulation. The memory map for IBEX core looks something like this: the RAM and all the other shared uh, peripherals uh, for the data and i caches are present from 80 million to 82 million. 
and uh, the test utils are present from 82 million and above. Now, if you look at the different examples which I have shared, uh, you can see that the tests can be loaded and executed at any uh, given location uh, in the memory. And this is what uh, Riskov facilitates you to do, where you can uh, have any custom behavior which you want defined and uh, the tests uh, are compiled according to that behavior irrespective of uh, whether the reference model is configured or able to do so. Now let's take a look at how you would set up your testing environment on your testing system for uh, running your uh, ACT on your DOT via Risco. Uh, Risco provides a few utilities or commands which can help enable uh, you to write the plugins necessary as well as all the configuration files necessary. Uh, the first command on your screen, uh, the Discord setup command over here, uh, it helps set up all the reference plugins needed for you to run ACT, as well as it generates a few templates uh, for you, you to get started with writing your own UT plugin. Discord also allows you to clone the ACT repo, the standard ACT repo from GitHub by just uh, using the simple uh, Discord arctest hyphen clone command on your uh, system. Uh, at the end of these two commands, if you look at the files which are generated, you will have a uh, config.ini file, which is what uh, is used by Discord to figure out uh, various different things, such as uh, what should be the reference plugin, what should be the DUT plugin, which should uh, be used, and uh, any other auxiliary information which should be provided to the plugins. Then you also have the test suite from GitHub, which was cloned as part of the second command. And finally, you have the uh, plugin directory themselves. Now, let's take a brief, uh, brief overview of the config.ini uh, file, which is generated by the setup command. So over here, you have a node for this part. And under this node, you can typically only have these four keys present. Uh, in future, uh, as support grows, you might have additional keys which are present. The first is the reference plugin key which indicates the name of the reference plugin to import. Uh, for, for those of you who are very familiar with Python, this is the name of the class itself. Then uh, there is also a reference plugin path, which indicates uh, where the Python file uh, for the plugin can be found. Essentially, this should point to the directory which was created as part of the setup command, uh, such as over here. So an absolute path to this particular directory will uh, be placed over here. Similarly, you have the same uh, two nodes for the DUT plugin also. Uh, a good point to note over here is that for each and every uh, plugin, you can define uh, its own node and uh, Riskov will just pass that particular information to the plugin as it is. So if you, if you define a node uh, with the name test DUT over here, which is uh, the same name as the DOT plugin, uh, which is provided uh, in the Riskov name. This particular information will be serialized inside Riskov and given as a directory to the reference plugin, uh, sorry, to the plugin uh, during the object creation phase so that uh, the plugin can use this information as it pleases. Uh, in this particular example, what is being done is uh, the paths to the uh, ISA specification and the platform specification YAML are uh, being provided to the plugin uh, using this particular node. But you're free to use, define, and uh, pass any information you require. Uh, now, similarly, the reference plugin is the sale underscore T frame over here, which has been generated by this course. And uh, if you remember in the initial uh, slide when we were talking about installing uh, sale on your system, uh, you, you, you know, that there was a way to install sail using a Docker image. Now, uh, to use the Docker image while running the test to generate the signature, you need to provide these two keys as part of the uh, same node in the config.ini file. Uh, but if, if you have uh, sail installed locally, you are going to skip these two keys over here. Now, uh, let's take a look at the plugin directory contents or uh, 
So what, what, what is generated as part of the set of command for the plugins? Now, uh, you have an env folder and inside the env folder, you have two files. The first is the linker file or uh, your implementation or TUT. You can use this to compile tests at a particular location, to uh, reorder sections, to relocate sections, and uh, so on. So this particular linker file will be used by uh, your plugin to compile uh, the tests for your uh, implementation only. Uh, similar to uh, uh, this, there will be a linker file in the reference plugin directory also, which will be used to compile tests to run on the same reference plugin. The tests have been written uh, in such a way that uh, the location of each of these sections does not matter or does not influence the signatures directly. And hence, uh, irrespective of any relocation problems, your signatures should have. Similarly, uh, there are a few model specific macros which has to be defined by your implementation that will be present in a header file, which is called uh, model underscore test dot edge, uh, as shown in the uh, slides. The, so essentially, when the compilation is being done, this env path should be uh, passed as part of the hyphen i argument for those of you who are using PCC uh, in the compilation phase of your test. We will talk a little bit more about this uh, when, when, when we are looking at how the plugin should be written and what are the uh, some functions of the plugin itself. Then along with these uh, env files, uh, there is also uh, a Python file which is generated, which is the Discord plugin itself. We, we will talk a little bit about this in depth uh, in the upcoming slides. Finally, there are the uh, ISA configuration files. Uh, the, the first is the ISA configuration. The second is the platform configuration. These are in the file config format. You can find more information about uh, the these files themselves by looking at the this by content documentation. But to give you an example of how the uh, basic configuration file should look like, this is the minimal amount of information you need to define at the current stage for you to run the test, right? Uh, you only need the ISA, the physical address size, uh, the user spec version, and also the supported excellence at this point. As the test grow uh, more and more verbose, and as the testing scope increases, you will need to define more and more uh, registers, behaviors over here. But uh, let's say you have implemented only the default behaviors, which are specified in the spec. In that case, uh, you can you can just keep defining everything else. And if you just define uh, these few lines in the IIT configuration file, you should be uh, good to go. So uh, at this point, this illustrates the versatility of the environment itself, where you can go from a, a very uh, basic implementation to a more uh, complicated and uh, uh, you know a more robust implementation and define it and use uh, risk of to run the ECT on that implementation. Next, we will look at some uh, model specific macros which we were talking about earlier in the model underscore test.h file. Uh, the main purpose of these macros is to allow for model uh, specific behaviors for various operations to be defined uh, by the code uh, for the model itself. That is, uh, the model can define the assembly routines which should be executed in these cases. Uh, some of the examples are at boot, at halt, uh, for certain uh, interrupts uh, moving forward, and so on. Uh, now, this allows to compile the tests to run on the specific TUT based on its uh, configuration uh, and uh, allows the tests to be independent of uh, each of the uh, model specific information themselves. Uh, there are uh, two kinds of model specific macros. The first is the mandatory ones, which have to be defined, and the second is the optional ones, which uh, can or cannot be defined depending on the configuration. Uh, in this tutorial, I'll be covering only the uh, uh, compulsory ones. Uh, any optional ones uh, are defined in the uh, architectural compatibility test specification. Uh, the link for it is uh, in the slides, and you're free to go ahead and experiment with it offline. The first one is the RV model boot macro. So the entry mod, uh, entry label point in the test uh, points to the start of this particular macro. 
and uh, it should uh, contain the uh, assembly routine or the code for the booting process of your model. So any custom uh, operations or instructions you need to execute at the start uh, of uh, your model or you know at reset, that should be present in this macro. Uh, this the, the code over here is entirely model specific. You can have any sort of initialization routine. Uh, you can have uh, any custom instructions also if necessary in this uh, macro. Uh, at the end of this particular macro, it is assumed that the CSRs are at the reset state uh, as well as uh, uh, you know the empty vec, ST vec, and UT vec as applicable. Uh, you know, they, they should uh, be pointing to a region which has read, write, and execute permissions, or uh, they should be writable themselves. Uh, this is the requirement from the track handler, right? Uh, for the risk five ISA sim or spike uh, and sale, they define this as an empty macro, as no custom operations need to be performed for these models. Uh, now, when we are discussing uh, any model-specific macros, uh, we'll be using uh, Spike as an example because it is a, a very famous uh, uh, ISS. It is open source, and uh, it's pretty easy to understand for most people also. Then we look at uh, the uh, data begin and end macros for model. The, that is the RV model data begin and RV model data end. Uh, the data begin macro uh, indicates the start of the signature section. Uh, so any code which you need, uh, or you know, any, any kinds of labels or indications which you have to put in in assembly, uh, any assembler directives which you need to demarcate the start of the signature section, uh, they have to be put in over here. Uh, similarly, uh, RV model data end defines the end of the signature section. Uh, now uh, you have examples for uh, spike on the screen. Uh, Spikes defines the RV model data begin and data end macros in this particular way. Uh, so from lines two to five, you have a custom section for uh, the uh, front end server of Spike, uh, which which allows uh, signature dumping, uh, I/O operations, printf, uh, scanf, and so on. And then finally, you have the uh, labels which indicate the start and end of the signature region. Uh, for spike, uh, this is then picked up by the simulation environment inside spike to uh, identify the signature section and dump out signatures appropriately. So over here, they are begin signature and end underscore signature uh, as seen on lines eight and uh, line two in the second snippet. Then we come to the RB model uh, underscore halt macro. Now, uh, this is the macro which is executed at the end of the test. So after uh, the test completes its uh, assembly sequences for testing, it will uh, jump to this particular macro. That is, the program counter will come to the start of this macro. Uh, before, uh, there are a few assumptions which you need to uh, know uh, so that uh, you, can, you can know what to expect of the state of the core uh, uh, when the core is entering into this particular macro. So before entry to this macro, the state uh, of all architectural states are restored to what they were at the end of the RV model boot uh, macro. Uh, so uh, not all states are restored because if the uh, test is testing some of the uh, features which are sticky, such as the PMP CFG, L bits, and so on, uh, in those cases, those states cannot be restored. So uh, essentially, what, what this means is that any state which can be restored uh, and is being tested by the uh, test, uh, it will be restored before entering this macro. Uh, so what, do, what should you be performing uh, or what operation should you be performing inside this macro as part of your uh, duty? Uh, you can perform any necessary operations such as IO to dump signature, uh, like we were looking at a few of the assembly routines before uh, for implementations such as serve and new rv32 where you need to perform some extensive io operations using uh, uart peripherals or some other memory map peripheral you will put in those routines uh, as part of this macro uh, at the end of this macro it should halt or terminate so you are free to do whatever you want uh, at this point inside the test as long as you are not uh, modifying any of the 
uh, results of the test themselves. And uh, at, at the end of this particular macro, you are halting the simulation or uh, the running of the test. Now, if we have examples from uh, two different models, the first is the uh, spike or the spike bias system. The second is chromite, uh, just to correlate with uh, how uh, you would perform the signature dumping operation inside this macro. So uh, the, for, for chromite, uh, if you remember, it's just a memory map peripheral which needs the locations of the begin signature and end signature labels, and that is what you see from lines three to eight, where uh, those addresses are being written onto the corresponding memory locations of the peripheral. And then finally, uh, you just exit sim for uh, spike. It is writing uh, non-zero value to the two host location, uh, which is defined inside the uh, RV model data begin macro, which we saw earlier. Uh, similarly, for chromite, it is just writing a non-zero value into a particular memory location. Then finally, we come to the uh, linker script. Now, uh, the linker scripts uh, should be used to, uh, to map sections of the test appropriately to the corresponding memory locations, which have the uh, necessary PMAs for that particular section. Uh, for example, your code section should have execute permissions uh, and so on and so forth, right? Now, the entry point uh, in the linker script should be set to RB test uh, underscore entry underscore point. This is something which you should note because that is how the tests are written. And uh, they, they, are con uh, they are written in a way that uh, the starting of the RV model underscore boot macro always points to RV test underscore entry underscore point so that uh, uh, some semblance of uniformity can be maintained across implementations. Now, uh, you're free to map the sections to any memory region you like. So you have to example uh, linker scripts on your screen at this point. The first is the one which is used for spike and sale. Uh, where everything starts from 80 million and then uh, it, it all goes uh, continuously starting from 80 million and uh, towards the higher memory location. First is the boot section, then, then there is the test code section, then there is the data section, or uh, the test data section, and finally the signature section. Uh, and this is how the memory is laid out in this particular linker script. Right? And every, every, all the memory locations are contiguous, all uh, and the assumption here is that uh, all of this addressable memory is starting from 80 million and has all the necessary PMAs, that is read, write, uh, and execute permissions for the entire uh, address space. But that might not be the case for your implementation. So let's say you had to reorder uh, your memory, uh, your, your sections, or you had to map them to different memory locations. How would you do that? Uh, this is a very a uh, trivial example, uh, I, I'm not discussing the uh, contents or the uh, format of the linker script itself. Uh, more uh, information would be uh, available online on how to write a linker script, but uh, one such example is illustrated in the slides, where uh, let's say you have a memory map uh, which starts at 20 million and 20 million to 40 million is only data or the test data which is uh, which is how it should be mapped. And then you have 40 million to 80 million where you can only have the test signature section. And finally, if starting from 80 million is where the executable memory starts. So you can do so by appropriately changing the linker script, reordering the sections in the linker script and ensuring that in the output uh, uh, binary, the sections are uh, present appropriately or mapped appropriately. Uh, th there is an example for the spike uh, link, linker script, uh, the link is inside in, in the slides. Uh, you're free to go ahead uh, and look at it and make modifications as necessary. So, uh, to, to call back on one of the previous uh, things which we learned, that is uh, your tests need not be uh, loaded at the same place in, your, in the memory on both your reference and uh, your implement and on the DUT for the tests to succeed. Uh, for for example, uh, for sale, they will always be loaded at uh, 80 million. That is, for sale, the linker script on the left-hand side will always be used 
uh, but you are free to use your own linker script for the uh, deal. Now let's take a look at how you would write a plugin to run your duty with uh, this copy. Now, plugins are essentially uh, Python files, and these files define how Riskoff can interface with your implementation. Uh, the template for the uh, plugin is on screen. Uh, you, would, you would get something similar, but with uh, more code in it uh, when you run the setup command uh, from Riskoff. The primary thing to note over here is that the uh, name of the class in, in your plugin file uh, it should be similar or it, 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 it should match the name which you have mentioned in your input config.ini file. And the Python file should be named as uh, risk of underscore dot name.py, uh, where dot name is essentially the name of the class in the config.ini file. Uh, the, the, the class in your plugin file should inherit the uh, plugin template class, which is defined by Riskoff, and you can do so by looking at lines uh, one and two uh, in the snippet. Now, the plugin should have four functions. One is the init underscore underscore init function or the constructor of the class. The second is the initialize function, uh, then followed by build and uh, run test. Each of these functions has a specific uh, task to be performed. Now, if if your particular implementation does not require you to do anything in any of these functions, you're skip to uh, you're, you're free to just uh, implement these as uh, empty functions. But these functions should be defined in your particular class. Uh, finally, you should also add uh, or uh, add your uh, add the name of your duty uh, on uh, under lines three and four. Uh, as the underscore underscore model and underscore underscore version variables. Uh, this is because these would directly be written into in the report HTML files, and it will allow you to uh, identify which report belongs to which implementation. Now, inside the init class, all you should be doing is uh, setting up any uh, private vari variables which you would be using. Uh, th this is also where you would uh, get the uh, node, the pass through node from the config.ini file, and any decisions which you have to make using the values in that node, uh, this is where you would be doing it. Okay. Now, in the initialize function, uh, the arguments are essentially the, the sweep directory path, the work directory path uh, for risk of, and the uh, env path to the, uh, or, or the, the folder path where the environment files from the uh, arc test uh, environment are present. You can store these uh, as private variables. You can you can uh, manipulate these as you want, or you can copy these to a separate location. Uh, wh wh whatever you choose to do, you should be doing this uh, at this particular uh, function. Then comes the build function, where the arguments are the paths to the uh, validated uh, ISA and platform YAML configs. Uh, essentially, if you want to build your implementation or you want to compile your RTL code into a binary or you have to configure certain aspects of your implementation using the values specified in the in the configuration files, you should be doing that in the in this function. And finally, it is the run tests function where you have to uh, where the argument is the test list itself, uh, which, which is essentially a list of the filtered tests along with all the necessary uh, information to compile and run those tests. So uh, you would compile and run those tests on your implementation. And at the end of this particular function, the risk of expects that the signature files are present in the appropriate uh, uh, location uh, for each of the tests. Now let's look at the functions themselves. The first is the constructor or the underscore underscore init function. So over here, you can uh, get the pass-through node from the config INI file by just uh, look, looking at the code at line two. So if you include this uh, piece of code in your function, you would be able to get uh, that node as a dictionary. And then you can use it to initialize any private variables you want. 
uh, in this particular example, uh, the spike plugin uses uh, the path specified in the config INI node to uh, specify which, uh, what, what is the path of the ISA configuration file and the platform configuration file. Now, these two variables are particularly important and these should be set by every single implementation because uh, this is how RISCOF discovers what is the configuration uh, file or the location of the configuration file for your implementation. Then comes the uh, initialize function. So for Spike, the initialize function essentially just constructs uh, a template for the uh, compile command. In this particular case, it uses the uh, GCC compiler. So it, it constructs the com uh, compile command template for that particular for for the GCC compiler. So over here you see on line 13, uh, the custom linker file path is provided to the hyphen t argument of GCC. Similarly. Uh, the custom, uh, it, the path which contains the model specific header files, the env path is provided to the hyphen i argument on line 14. And finally, the uh, arc test uh, env path is also provided to the hyphen i argument. Then we come to the uh, build function. Uh, the arguments are essentially the paths to the checked configuration files, as I mentioned. Uh, in Spike, this particular uh, this particular configuration is uh, taken in and parsed to figure out the ISA under which the Spike binary should execute. Uh, the certain aspects such as the X length, the I, uh, the MR string, the ISA string, the ABI string, all of that is figured out by looking at the ISA mentioned inside the uh, YAML configuration. Then we come to the most important uh, function of all, that is the run tests function. The arguments to the run tests function are the test list and the CGF files. Now, for most implementations, the CGF files are of no consequence and they can be safely ignored. You don't need to do anything with those CGF files. Uh, the as far as the test list goes, it is uh, it is it is a dictionary object where each node in the dictionary is in a particular format. And if you look at the uh, YAML output of that particular dictionary, uh, the, the format of that node is explained in the top two uh, images. Now, uh, there will be a one is to one correlation uh, 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 with the number of nodes in the test list and the number of entries uh, in the uh, test list object, which is obtained inside the run test function. And uh, the, if those of you who are familiar with the YAML format can directly correlate, but essentially all you need to do is uh, you, you need to use the key, which is, uh, which is on the screen to access that particular uh, element inside the node. And you can use that value, however you want to construct the, uh, the, the compile commands, the run commands uh, as needed. Now, uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, test list YAML at this point, uh, just so that uh, you, you understand uh, what are the, uh, what, what information is present for each and every test. The key uh, for, for each node in that uh, YAML or each node in that dictionary is the name of the assembly file uh, itself. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, in, in this particular example, it is the div uh, assembly file which is present at this particular path. Now, the database YAML file and the uh, test list YAML file both have the same root level keys. Uh, they would essentially have similar information, but uh, the test list YAML would contain a subset of information from the database YAML file. Most implementers do not have to play around or modify with the database YAML file. So uh, I have not uh, cover, touched upon it in this particular tutorial, but if needed, you can uh, go ahead and look at the documentation to explore further. Uh, I'll be talking about the test list uh, YAML file uh, mostly in this particular slide.
Now, the test list YAML also contains the work directory for that particular test. This is where you can generate the uh, test artifacts. And finally, this, the signature should also be present in this particular directory. Then comes the macros. Uh, these are the macros which should be defined uh, for the test to compile successfully. Then you have the ISA. The, uh, this is essentially the ISA under which the test should be compiled. Uh, now for GCC, th there will be a one is to one correlation with the entry present over here and the argument which you pass to the uh, hyphen MR uh, string. Then you have the coverage labels. These coverage labels indicate uh, the co cover points which these uh, this test is trying to uh, target, essentially the scenarios which this test is trying to cover as part of the testing uh, routine. And finally, the test path, which is the path to the assembly file, which contains the test itself. Uh, an example for the div test is shown on the left-hand side. Uh, the ISA for the div test is RP64IM. The macros needed are, and their respective values are present on lines 4 and 5. Uh, lines 7 and 8 specify that uh, this particular test uh, uh, targets the div coverage uh, label. And finally, the path where the div test is present itself. Now, in the run test uh, function, what you would have to do is you would have to iterate through the dictionary. And for each node in the dictionary, you would have to uh, treat it as one particular test to be run and uh, construct your implementation commands, run it, generate the signature file, and uh, you know, place it at the appropriate location. Now, you can access these by just uh, specifying the key values inside square packets and, uh, and using that to construct the command. Uh, like shown in line six, where you can construct the compile command by using the values from the node. You would uh, set the uh, ISA uh, uh, as it is present in the node. In this particular case, since we are using GCC, you set the MR value. Uh, and you uh, define the macros by prefixing uh, the macros with a hyphen D argument uh, in GC, for, for GCC. Then comes the signature file. Now, RISCOF expects the signature file to be named in a particular way, and it should be present in the work directory for that particular test. So you can construct the uh, signature uh, file path by uh, looking at the code snippet on line eight in the second uh, snippet over here, right? So the signature file should be named in this way where you use self dot name uh, with the square bracket, uh, semicolon, uh, minus one and square brackets closed followed by uh, or concatenated with the dot signature. So essentially this is the name of the uh, plugin itself or the implementation itself followed by the dot signature suffix to indicate that this is the signature file which RISCOF should be looking at. Now for spike, uh, the, the spike binary takes the signature file as a command line argument. So in this particular case in lines uh, 9 and 10, uh, the constructed uh, signature file path is passed as an argument or substituted inside the uh, run template for spike and uh, the uh, run command is uh, constructed. You uh, Similarly, the ISA which is extracted from the config is also uh, passed as an argument uh, in this particular case to the spike uh, run template. Uh, yeah, so uh, like I was talking, lines 9 and 10 uh, show the uh, command to execute uh, spike, uh, which is being constructed using the arguments from the uh, test list. Now, finally, we come to the uh, make utility. Essentially, uh, in the previous step, we saw how we would construct the commands to uh, run on implementation. Now, this talks about how you would actually execute those commands uh, since we are uh, writing things in Python. Now, uh, there are multiple ways to do this, but Riskoff provides a make utility to abstract away all of this uh, from the user. So you can just import the make utility and uh, use it as a class as seen on uh, line one. 
the arguments to the class are the path where you want the make file to be generated uh, and uh, a, a, a name for the make file. You can also modify the uh, command uh, which is used to run the make file. The default is make, but you can essentially go ahead and use pmake, vmake, uh, and so on. You can also uh, run things parallelly by using the hyphen j argument. Uh, so if you if you modify the uh, make command variable inside the make object, you can modify what command is being used to run the make file itself. Then you would construct the command for each and every test as we saw in the previous step. And you would add it as a target to the make file by using the add target uh, API function uh, and passing the command as an argument to that particular function. Then uh, you would execute, uh, you, you would have to execute those commands uh, in the make file or the targets in the make file. So to do that, you can run a single target by doing by using the execute API, or you can run all of the targets at once by using the execute underscore all uh, API. You can also uh, specify the work directory. Uh, you can you can specify the target name, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so th th this is a very uh, basic uh, snippet of code which will work for all cases. But if you want to uh, explore or use it in a, in a more advanced way, you can look at the API documentation uh, on the hosted uh, risk of uh, HTML documentation. An example target using the make utility for the uh, div test, which we saw previously, is shown on screen. Uh, you use uh, GCC to compile uh, the test. Uh, you, you, you essentially CD into the work directory for the test on line three. You use the MR argument uh, from the uh, test list YAML, uh, in this particular case, RV64 IM. Uh, you use the paths to the custom linker and header files uh, as constructed previously uh, in the uh, initialize phase. Uh, you also use the ACT header file location on line seven. And finally, on line nine, you have the macros which have to be used for uh, compilation. Now, once uh, compiled, uh, the output is available at, as a, at the dut.elf, uh, under, under the dut.elf name. And lines 10 and 11 over here uh, run the ELF binary on uh, Spike. Now, if you look at line 11, you would see the uh, signature file path or the signature file name. Uh, for, for the Spike, essentially, the uh, name comes out to dut spike.signature. And this is how, uh, in each and every work directory for each and every test, the signature files will be named for the spike implementation. Now, there is an alternate method to uh, execute the commands. W what we saw was one easy way to do it by using the make utility, which Viscoff provides. But uh, the, the, the point uh, to understand over here, or the point to take away over here is that Whenever the run test API is called by RiskOff for each and every plugin, complete control is transferred to the plugin itself. And all RiskOff uh, expects is that uh, at the end of the function, when the function returns back to uh, RiskOff, all the signature files are present at that particular location. So you are free to go ahead and uh, execute the commands or execute the tests however uh, you want. You can, you can use any external operations such as make files or uh, another alternative is a subprocess call. So as indicated in this flowchart, the control is entirely transferred from this call to the plugin when the APIs are called, right? So there is no difference in, uh, uh, which is, uh, or no observable difference from this call uh, depending on which uh, execution method you choose. You can choose to run using make files, you can choose to run using subprocess calls, or you can go ahead and do something custom of your own. So uh, there is an uh, example on the screen which shows how to execute the commands which you have constructed using a subprocess sub call. There is a risk of utility which allows you to uh, run a, a command as a shell command Using a subprocess call, you just uh, import the utility. You use the dot shell command, uh, the utils dot shell command class to construct the, uh, the the object to run the shell command, 
and then you use the dot run API to run the command as a different sub process. Now, uh, the sale uh, plugin also supports uh, reference signature uh, generation via the uh, Docker images. Uh, that, that is one example which you can refer to to see how you can use uh, different execution environments or different interaction schemes to generate the uh, signatures. Uh, that is left as an exercise to the user to understand that and uh, explore it further if needed. Uh, this was all about how uh, you would run the tests on your implementation and generate the signatures or essentially uh, writing the plugins. Now we move on to how you could debug the tests uh, or the ACTs themselves. Uh, this is not covered in depth because this involves a lot of uh, information about uh, or implementa implementation specific information themselves. But the tests have been written in such a way that there are a few essential features which you can uh, leverage uh, while debugging. So uh, like uh, each instance in the test is preceded by a label uh, as shown in line uh, one in your first snippet. Now this label should appear uh, in, in all disassemblies which you generate uh, if, if you're using a standard disassembler. Now, if you're using a custom disassembler, obviously, uh, that is not something which uh, it, or that feature may or may not be present in your disassembler. But if you use the standard uh, disassemblers, you should be able to correlate the uh, label in the test to the uh, label to, to the label in your disassembly. So you would uh, run the test, you would generate an execution log for the test, and then uh, use the disassembly to correlate with the execution log and figure out where things went uh, wrong. Uh, now, uh, when would you want to debug a test, right? So that is essentially when your signature has mismatched. Now, each signature will have been uh, updated by a single store uh, instruction in the entire test. So if you figure out which store instruction has updated, sorry, yeah, which store instruction has updated that particular signature entry, you can go ahead and uh, figure out which instance in that particular test is causing the problem. Now, uh, let, let's say you have uh, uh, fixed something on uh, your implementation or in the test or uh, something like that, and you need to run only that one test. Uh, there are a few different ways to do it. First is to edit the database file to contain the entry, which is corresponding only to that particular test. And then you use that updated or edited database file, pass it to RISCOF using the hyphen hyphen DB file argument, which we discussed earlier uh, with the hyphen hyphen no clean argument. So essentially for every single RISCOF run, the work directory is cleaned up. So if you give the hyphen hyphen no clean argument, then uh, the cleaning up uh, is skipped and uh, you can reuse the same artifacts or the same work directories for the test. So you can, Pass the uh, hyphen uh, pass the custom DB file with only that particular test entry uh, using the hyphen hyphen DB file and ensure that Riskov runs only that one test. Now, uh, since you 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 may not be familiar with the database file, you can also edit just the test list uh, YAML and pass that as argument to the uh, to Riskov uh, via the CLI similar to the DB file. Uh, this is the recommended way of doing things. Uh, finally, you can also isolate the test into a separate directory and uh, pass that directory as an argument to the suite. This is a, a, a more naive way of uh, doing things, but it is far easier to do also. So you, you, you are free to choose whichever you are comfortable with and uh, use that to run a single test on your implementation. Now, uh, let's say, you don't want to run the entire test also. You just want to run only a single instance. How would you do that? So you would edit the source file or the test source file to include only defaulting uh, test case or test instance. And uh, you, you would have to identify which instance you want to run by looking at the disassembly and your execution logs uh, and signature files uh, at the start, obviously. But once you have done that, you can edit the test uh, using uh, yeah, using this information and then using one of the uh, mentioned uh, methods, you can just run that one test on your duty and ensure that 
that particular bug has been fixed or targeted and then move on to uh, running uh, all, all the other tests. Now, if you're using the make utility, which uh, I was talking about in the earlier slides, now each of uh, a, a single uh, target in your, uh, or, 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 a, or a single trans test translates to a single target in your make utility. So you can just identify that particular target and just run that uh, single test on your implementation. But at this point, Riskoff will not be uh, running, so you will not be able to compare the signatures automatically via Riskoff from uh, the reference model uh, in this particular uh, use case. Uh, however, it should be noted that uh, once you have fixed the final reports which are generated for proving architectural compatibility, they should include all the tests and uh, you should not be using any of these uh, steps to uh, do uh, your uh, to to generate your final report for uh, ACT uh, self certification. Now uh, there is one pitfall which uh, I would like to address uh, in the way the current uh, ACTs are set up. That is, uh, there is no trap handler which is defined in the uh, test by default. So MTVEC is not initialized uh, at the start of every test, right? Now, this is not a bug. This is actually a feature because the entire privilege spec is optional. So uh, keeping uh, in, in line with the philosophy of RISC-V, the tests are also written in such a way that if uh, only the unprivileged spec, uh, portion of the specification is uh, uh, implemented, then uh, only the unprivileged tests are run. And similarly, all the tests only contain the unprivileged instructions and no privileged instructions are present. Right. Uh, so the, essentially, if you have a custom implementation with a custom privilege spec, you, you would still be able to run the uh, architectural compatibility test for the unprivileged side of things. Uh, so the, this is uh, by design, and hence all tests do not instantiate a trap handler. Only tests which, ex which are expected to trap, that is the test behavior which is covered as part of your privilege specification, uh, are uh, uh, do instantiate the trap handler. Now, uh, so th this might cause uh, problems for uh, implementations if uh, the implemented behavior is wrong or a test which is not supposed to trap traps on your implementation and uh, your implementation, uh, the, the implemented behavior is wrong. Right? So to tackle this, what you could do, there are a couple of things you could do. One is uh, you can initialize a default trap handler in the uh, RV, model, uh, RV model boot macro. Now, this is the recommended way of doing things, uh, but uh, the, the uh, architectural test header files, they do contain the architectural test trap handler and you can definitely, and they are enabled by defining a macro in the command line. So you can definitely go ahead and force to include that macro in your plugin, but that is not recommended because it comes with its own uh, caveats. Uh, the easiest way to do is to define your own custom trap handler in RV model boot. Now you can define a very complicated trap handler, which gives you all sorts of debugging information, or you can just do something simple, which ensures that the test exits and you can use other debugging methods. Uh, one such example is given in uh, on, on your screen. Uh, this is a very simple trap handler where uh, you know the, the handler just jumps to the shutdown routine, which is present at the end of the test. And inside the uh, model boot macro, uh, when the tests start executing, MTVEC is written with the address of that particular trap handler. Now, what this ensures is that uh, the uh, whenever a trap is encountered and the test trap handler uh, is not initialized because uh, the test starts after the RV model boot macro. So if the test is instantiating a trap handler, it would initialize uh, the empty vec to point to the trap handler, uh, which is provided by the test. Uh, so this ensures that you have a default fallback mechanism to go to. And uh, in case your implementation has uh, has some undefined behavior or has implemented the wrong behavior for certain uh, instructions, you would be uh, able to exit the test. Uh, one, one thing to note at this point is that uh, the ISA strings uh, do not include ZICSR. So if you are uh, doing 
uh, or, or if you're instantiating a trap handler, which uh, or a default trap handler in, in your RV model boot macro, you might want to include the ZICSR in the ISA string while compiling the tests, uh, depending on your toolchain and the toolchain version and whether the toolchain expects uh, ZICSR as an extension uh, in the ISA string. Now we come to talk about the future of architectural testing. Uh, currently, only the unprivileged uh, tests are present uh, as part of the ACT compliant uh, ACT suite. Uh, uh, that too, only from IEMC FD extensions, uh, uh, along with a few of the unratified extensions such as P, uh, some of the ratified extensions such as K and B also. Uh, in, in future, we are currently working on the uh, CSR tests, that is the privileged uh, portion of the specification. We are also looking at uh, testing certain peripherals which are defined by the ISA specifications, such as the uh, salient controller. Then uh, we are also looking at uh, writing tests for the uh, memory model, that is the RVWMO memory model. Uh, the, this is on the architectural test uh, suite side. Then in RISCOF, we are looking to add uh, the ability to extract labels of which this instance has failed by uh, using the ELF and the signature files, uh, as well as the disassembly files. So we are, we are trying to automate uh, a lot of the debugging steps which you would have to perform when a test fails and provide as much information to the user as possible to pinpoint and figure out which test has failed and what is the condition under which uh, that particular test has failed. Uh, finally, we are also looking at tools and interfaces which uh, need to be developed for async interrupt, interrupt testing. Uh, this would involve interfaces which have to be implemented on the RTL side uh, and uh, how, how would these tools uh, interface with RISCOF so that uh, the, the testing conditions can be made as similar as possible on both the reference model and the uh, DOT or implementation. Uh, for, for more uh, information, you're welcome to join the ACT calls or uh, interact with us on the uh, repos. Now, the, I'll just briefly summarize the takeaways from this tutorial. First, we saw a brief overview of ACTs, what the uh, ACTs are, what is the philosophy of testing in ACT, and uh, uh, how are the tests themselves structured. Then uh, we looked at RISCOF and uh, we, we, we saw how RISCOF works and uh, what are the necessary, uh, necessary additions uh, in the DOT uh, which you have to make uh, so that you can use it. Uh, you, can, you can use RISCOF to run the ACTs on your DOT, uh, essentially getting a signature dumping mechanism. Then we looked at uh, how to run the ACT on the duty by using the risk of. Uh, we also looked at the testing environments. Uh, how how do you get the how do you write the risk of plugin? How do you write the uh, model specific macros? Uh, what are, what should the model specific macros do? And uh, how how do you write the linker file? And finally, we looked at a few uh, debugging strategies. Uh, the links for all of the materials are present in the slides themselves. And for any feedback or questions, please file issues on uh, GitHub, uh, the suite repository, and the framework, rep the Discord framework repository are linked in the slides. This brings us to the uh, end of the tutorial, and uh, I will open the floor to any questions you might have uh, that we can uh, address at this point.